Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, if you've been following through all the videos for AP World History Unit 4, then we have finally got to the end of it, and we need to review the whole dang unit. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get to it. All right, now, before we jump in, you should know that this unit review is part of a larger AP World History review packet. And in this review packet, you will find reviews for all units of AP World History. You'll find practice multiple choice questions for every unit, essential questions about the most important material in the curriculum, and two full AP style practice tests. I put a lot of hard work in it to make sure you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. So if you need some review help, I highly recommend going to get it. Link in the description below. All right, Unit 4. The main theme of this unit is the transoceanic interconnections that occurred in the world from 1450 to 1750. All right, if you have no idea what that means, let me try to strip all the AP speak off of it and explain it up real nice. This unit is all about the development and expansion of sea-based empires, also known as maritime empires. And the leading player in this new kind of empire was Europe, and that's kind of a big deal because because up to this point in world history, Europe is kind of behind everybody else in terms of economics and empire build. But during this period, Europeans assumed a primary place on the world stage as an imperial power to be reckoned with. Now, how did they do that? Well, the first answer is the advancement of technology, especially maritime technology. One advance was the creation of new kinds of ships, like the flute, the caravel, and the carrack. The what, the what, and the what? The flute, the caravel, and the carrack. Now, what's important to know about these ships is that they were smaller, faster, and much cheaper to build, and much nimbler on the seas. Additionally, these were strictly merchant ships. Now, the general practice up to this time was to build merchant ships that could be converted into warships if needed. But starting with the Portuguese, the great innovation was to make these trading ships trading ships only, and that's why they were cheaper. And one of the reasons they were faster and more nimble was the introduction of the Latin sail. This was a triangular sail that allowed sailors to harness wind on both sides of the boat instead of just waiting for it to blow from behind. Now, this was not a European invention. The Arabs and the Chinese had been using them for a long time before this. The Europeans are just now catching up. There were also navigational technologies that made it possible to sail greater distances. Improved astronomical charts enabled sailors to reckon their positions on the seas. The astrolabe and the magnetic compass made it possible to pinpoint a ship's exact location as it sailed. Now again, Europeans didn't invent these technologies, they just harnessed their power for their own purposes during this time. And all this made it possible for Europeans to venture out into the Atlantic Ocean to search for a sea route to Asia. And the reason why they wanted to do that is because Muslims controlled most of the land-based trade routes and that made it impossible for Europeans to establish trade on their own terms. Now, as the Europeans took to the sea and sailed west, it turns out that they ran smack into a continent that they didn't know existed, namely the Americas. And it was Christopher Columbus who was the first to make this discovery of the new land unknown to the Europeans. And I know that's arguable because, you know, the Vikings and some people say the Chinese discovered America, but, you know, for our purposes, it's Christopher Columbus. And he landed in the Caribbean islands and sparked a massive global change which is known as the Columbian Exchange. And essentially, the Columbian Exchange was a biological exchange of animals, people, food, and diseases between the Eastern and Western Hemispheres. Now, it's going to be important for you to know at least some specific examples of some of those exchanges that took place across the Atlantic, and maybe disease is the most important. The Europeans brought smallpox with them, and when that disease began to spread among the natives of the Americas, the consequences were devastating. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 90 percent of the native population was killed by the disease. But in happier news, the natives of America sent syphilis back with the Europeans to spread among themselves. Now, there's some debate scientifically on whether the syphilis actually came from the Native Americans, but that's at least the story that the Europeans told themselves. In terms of food and animals, Europe introduced sugar and horses to the Americas. And the Americas sent potatoes and maize and guinea pigs back to Europe. And that's not even close to everything that exchanged during this period, but those are a few specifics that you can hold on to. Now let's finish this section by talking about the exchange of people. And one of the most significant exchanges of people during this period was in the Atlantic slave trade. Once the colonizing Europeans realized that the climate in the Americas made for great agriculture, and once they failed miserably to make other systems of labor work, they turned to the importation of enslaved people from Africa. And this was a system known as chattel slavery, and chattel just means property. And so this was a kind of slavery in which people became the property of those that bought them. And this system of labor turned out to be the best solution for the European aims in the Americas. The Europeans had tried to enslave the natives to do their work, but the natives had the unthinkable gall to start dying in massive numbers from the European diseases. How dare you? And since we're talking about coerced labor systems in the Americas, I should tell you about a few that the Europeans tried in order to get get the natives to work for them. First, let's talk about the encomienda system. Under this system, Spanish conquistadors were tasked with protecting a group of natives, and in exchange for that,
that protection, they could force them to work on their land. The second system is called Hacienda. And under this system, many of the Spanish landowners turned their encomiendas, or their little land grants, into huge plantations, and guess who got to do the work? Neither of these systems worked out for long, and so then they borrowed from the Incans the Maida system. Now, under the Incan rulers, the Maida system was used to coerce labor for public projects. And this only occurred for a certain amount of days throughout the year. And so the Spanish looked around and said, that's a pretty good idea. We're going to do that. So they coerced men to labor for them for a certain amount of time. But the big difference was the Incan Maida system was done for the sake of public works, but the Spanish version of it was done for the sake of private gain. Now, upon the North American continent, the British used a system of labor called indentured servitude. But those servants were only bound to work for seven years, and after that, they were free to go. And they had the annoying habit of actually going free after their indenture was up. How dare you? So the importation of people from Africa solved all these problems for the colonists. These Africans were property for life, and because they had mingled with the larger Afro-Eurasian continent system for millennia, they weren't as susceptible to European diseases. And later, there will come a reckoning for such violations of human nature, but... Not yet. All right, let's talk economics for a hot minute. One of the major effects of the linking of the Eastern and the Western hemispheres during this time was a new global economy. So let's talk about the economic system itself first, and then we'll talk about the kind of imperial expansion that grew out of that economic system. So the economic system you need to know for this unit is mercantilism. This was the dominant economic system in Europe during this period, and I've explained more about it in other videos, but really what you need to know for our purposes in this unit review is this, that in a mercantilist mindset, there was only a fixed amount of wealth in the world. Like if you could somehow gather up all the gold and silver in the world and put it in a big pile, well, that's the amount of wealth that's in the world, sitting right in front of you in that pile. And by the way, that's how they measured wealth in mercantilist economies, gold and silver. And I always think about it like a pie. If you really believe that only one pie exists in the world and you want a bigger slice of that pie, that means necessarily that somebody else has to have a smaller slice of that pie. But the problem is this. In pie world, nobody wants a small piece of the pie. Everybody wants all the pie. And so as you can imagine, this system led to some intense rise rivalries among the European powers. What's that you say? Competition between mercantilist states? What a perfect time to talk about European establishment of colonies around the world. Mercantilism and colonial establishments are connected for the following reason. If a country wanted gold and silver coming in, which is to say wanted a bigger slice of the world pie, that means they had to have exports going out. And if they're going to export goods to other places, that means they have to have metric buttloads of raw materials in order to make those things to export. Where are they going to get all those raw materials? Well, Colonies. The Portuguese were the first to establish an empire for the sake of trade, but they did it a little differently than those who came after them. Instead of claiming huge portions of land, they merely set up what's called a trading post empire all along the African coast. And as a result of this, the Portuguese soon became a major player in the Indian Ocean trade network. But eventually, the Portuguese did establish more than trading posts, and the most significant example of this is their colony in Brazil. Now, not to be outdone by the Portuguese, the French and the British and the Dutch and the Spanish all rushed out to establish empires in the Americas. And the details of these overseas empires aren't as important, but what is important to know is that these colonies existed to serve the mother country. And that is the mercantilist mindset. Now I should mention here who is paying for all of this exploration and colonization. Well, in general, it was the states who were paying for it. But the British and the Dutch innovated on this count and created a new way to fund these ventures, namely joint stock companies. This was a way to fund exploration among private investors who shared the financial burden of that exploration and colonization among themselves. And the reason why they would take such a risk is because if the mission succeeded, then they would share in the fabulous wealth of the colonies. Now, the last thing I'll mention is the social changes that occurred when the Eastern and the Western Hemispheres were united. And there were upsets all over the world to social hierarchies, but maybe the most significant change in social hierarchy was in the Americas. With the introduction of Europeans into the Americas, a completely new social hierarchy was established. It's called the Casta System, and it was a new way of organizing the layers of society based on ancestry and race. At the top of the system were the Peninsulares, which were those who were born in Europe. Below them were the Criollos or the Creoles, which were Europeans, but like B-grade Europeans because they were born in the Americas. Below both of them were the Castas, which was a cascading mashup of natives and Africans. With the Castas, a further hierarchy was established. First was the Mestizos, who were of mixed European and indigenous ancestry. Second were the Mulattoes, which were the mixed European and African ancestry. Third were the Zambos, which were the mixed indigenous and African ancestry folks. And at the bottom of all were the indigenous people and the African people themselves. Okay, so that's what you need to know for Unit 4 of AP World History. Now, I've gone very quickly over a lot of information, and in some cases, I've been very general. So if you need to dive into the details, here's a playlist for all my topic videos for Unit 4. Now, my people, you know that I'm here to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. So if that's something you're into, subscribe and join the beard enthusiasts here at Heimler's History. <gasps> Heimler out.